Welcome to Celtic Tomes, bringing you readings from bygone books. Welcome to Celtic Tomes, readings by Gary and Ruth from the classic books of Celtic lore and study. Book 2, Chapter 5 of British Goblins, Welsh Folklore, Fairy Mythology, Legends and Traditions by Wirt Sykes. Book 2, Chapter 5 Familiar Spirits, including the famous sprite of Troyne Farm, Was It a Fairy? The Familiar Spirits of Magicians. Sir David Lloyd's Demon, Familiar Spirits in Female Form, The Legend of the Lady of the Wood, The Devil as a Familiar Spirit, His Disguises in this character, Summoning and Exercising Familiars, Jenkin the Pembrokeshire Schoolmaster, and The Terrible Tailor of Glanbran. Section 1 Innumerable are the Welsh stories of familiar spirits. Sometimes these are spectres of the sort whose antics we've just been observing. More often they're confessedly demons, things of evil. In numberless cases it is no less a personage than the Diawl himself who makes his appearance in the guise of a familiar spirit. The familiar spirit which takes up its abode in the household is, as we have seen, a pranksome goblin. Its personal appearance or rather its invisibility, is the saving circumstance which prevents it from being deemed a fairy. The familiar spirit which haunted the house of Job John Harry at the Troyne farm in the parish of Munithisluin was a stone-thrower, a stroker of persons, etc., but could not be seen. It is famous in Wales under the cognomen of Pukar Troyne and is referred to in my account of the Echlithdan. The tenants at present residing on the Troyne farm are strangers who have recently invaded the home of this ancestral spook, but I was able to glean abundant information concerning it from people thereabout. It made a home of Mr. Harry's house some time in the last century, for a period beginning some days before Christmas and ending with Easter Wednesday, on which day it departed. During this time it, it spoke, it did many remarkable things, but was always invisible. It began at first to make its presence known by knocking at the outer door in the night, but when persons went to open the door, there was no one there. This continued for some time, much to the perplexity of the door openers. At last, one night, it spoke to the one who opened the door, and the family were in consequence much terrified. Some of the neighbours hearing these tales came to watch with the family, and Thomas Evans foolishly brought a gun with him, to shoot the spirit, as he said. But as Job John Harry was coming home that night from the journey, the familiar spirit met him in the lane and said, There is a man come to your house to shoot me, but thou shalt see how I will beat him. <laughs> so Job went on to the house, and immediately stones were thrown at the unbelieving Thomas, who had brought the gun. "'stones from which he received severe blows. "'The company tried to defend him from the stones, "'which did strike and hurt him, and no other person, "'but their efforts were in vain. "'The result was that Thomas Evans took his gun "'and ran home as fast as his legs would carry him, "'and never again engaged in an enterprise of that sort. "'As this familiar spirit got better acquainted with its quarters, "'it became more talkative, and used often to speak from out of an oven by the hearth's side. It also took to making music a night with Job's fiddle. And one night, as Job was going to bed, the familiar spirit gave him a gentle stroke on the toe. "'Thou art curious in smiting,' said Job. "'I can smite thee where I please,' replied the spirit. And as time passed on, the family became accustomed to their ghostly visitor." and seeing it never did them any harm but on the contrary was a source of recreation to them they used to boldly speak to it and indulge in entertaining conversation one old man a neighbour more bold than wise hearing the spirit just by his side but being unable to see it 
threatened to stick it with his knife. <laughs> now, fool, quoth the spirit, <laughs> how canst thou stick what thou cannot see with thine eyes? When questioned about its antecedents, the spirit said, I came from Pushkaseg, Mare's Pit, a place in the adjacent mountain, and I knew ye all before I came hither. The wife of Morris Roberts desired one of the family to ask of the spirit who it was that killed William Riley, the Scotchman. Which being done, the spirit said, It was Blanche Bede who bade thee ask that question. And Blanche Bede, worldly Blanche, was Morris Roberts' wife ever after called. On Easter Wednesday, the spirit departed, saying, Tossen yach, Job. Fare thee well, Job. And Job asked the spirit, Where goest thou? And the reply was, Where God pleases. Let me recommend the scene of this story to tourists. It's a most romantic spot, on the top of a mountain, a glorious tramp from Crimlin, returning by another road to Abakan. Wheels cannot go there, though a sure-footed horse might bear one safely up. The ancient farmhouse is one of the quaintest in Wales, and must be hundreds of years old. Its front porch looks out over a ravine hardly less grand and lonely than a Californian gulch. There are other accounts of this Troin sprite which credit it to a time long anterior to last century. But all are consistent in this, that the goblin is always invisible. The sole exception to this rule is the legend about its having once shown a white hand to some girls in the kitchen, thrusting it through the floor of its room overhead for that purpose. Now, invisibility is a violation of fairy traditions, while ghosts are very often invisible. These wrapping and stone-throwing ghosts, always. It might be urged that the spirit was a boobach, seeing that it kept pretty closely to the house. But on the whole, I choose to class it among the inhabitants of the spirit world, and really, the student of folklore must classify his materials distinctly in some understandable fashion, or go daft. Section 2 The sort of familiar spirit employed by magicians in the 18th and preceding centuries was distinctly a demon. The spirit of this class, which was controlled by Sir David Lloyd, is celebrated in Wales. This Sir David was a famous dealer in the black art, who lived in Cardiganshire. He was a physician, and at one time a curate, but being known to deal in the magic art, he was turned out of the curacy and was obliged to live by practising physic. He was thought he learned the magic art in Oxford. It was this man of great wickedness, says the prophet Jones, to make use of a familiar spirit. The bishop did well in, in, in turning him out of the sacred office, though he was no ill-tempered man, for how unfit was such a man to read the sacred scripture? With what conscience could he ask the sponsors in baptism to undertake for the child to renounce the world, the flesh and the devil, who himself was familiar with one of the spirits of darkness? Uh, uh, of this, Sir David, I have, I have heard much, but chiefly depend upon uh, what was told to me by the Reverend Mr. Thomas Lewis, the, the curate of Llanthu and Talachty, uh, an excellent preacher of the gospel, and not sufficiently esteemed by his people which likely will bring a judgment on them in time to come. Mr. Lewis knew the young woman who had been Sir David's maidservant in the house where he lived. His familiar spirit he kept locked up in a book. Once, while he was in Radnorshire, and going from one house to another, he accidentally left his book behind him and sent his boy back to fetch it. The boy, being of an inquisitive turn of mind, open the book, a thing his master had expressly charged him not to do, and the familiar spirit immediately demanded to be set at work. The boy, though very much alarmed, had the wit to answer, Tafel gerig or avon, throw stones out of the river, which the spirit immediately did, so that the air was for a time full of flying stones and the boy was fain to skip about in a surprisingly active manner in order to dodge the same. After a while, having thrown up a great quantity of stones out of the river, the spirit again, with the pertinacity of its kind, asked for something to do. 
whereupon the boy bade it to throw the stones back again, which it did. Sir David, having waited for a long time for the boy to return, began to suspect that things had gone wrong, and so hastened back after him, and commanded the familiar spirit again into his book. Section 3 Familiar spirits of this class are not always invisible, and they can assume such forms as may be necessary to serve their purposes. A favourite shape with them is that of a young and lovely woman. Comparisons are here suggested with the water maidens and the other like forms of this fancy, but they need not be pursued. It is necessary for the student of phantoms to constantly remind himself of the omnipresent danger of being enticed too far afield, unless he keeps somewhat sternly to the path he has marked out. How ancient is the notion of a familiar spirit in female form may be seen from accounts which are given by Geraldus and other old writers. Near Caerleon, Monmouthshire, in the 12th century, Geraldus tells us there lived a Welshman named Malarius, who, by the following means, acquired the knowledge of future events and the occult sciences. Having on a certain night met a damsel whom he loved, in a pleasant and convenient place, while he was indulging in her embraces, instead of the beautiful creature he found in his arms, a hairy, rough, and hideous creature, the sight of which deprived him of his senses, and after remaining many years in this condition, he was restored to health in the church of St. David's, through the merits of its saints. Uh, but having always had an extraordinary familiarity with unclean spirits, by seeing them, knowing them, talking with them, and calling each by his proper name, he was enabled through their assistance to foretell future events. He was indeed often deceived, as they are, with respect to circumstances at a great distance, but was less mistaken in affairs which were likely to happen soon, or within the space of a year. They appeared to him on foot, equipped as hunters, with horns suspended from their necks, and truly as hunters, not of animals, but of souls. He particularly met them near monasteries and religious places, for where rebellion exists, there is the greatest need of armies and strength. He knew when any one spoke falsely in his presence, for he saw the devil, as it were, leaping and exulting upon the tongue of the liar, and it looked into a book faultily or falsely written, although wholly illiterate, he would point out the place with his finger. Being questioned how he could gain such knowledge, he said he was directed by the demon's finger to the place. In the same connection, Geraldus mentions a familiar spirit which haunted Lower Gwent. A, a demon incubus, who from his love for a certain young woman, and frequenting the place where she lived, often conversed with men, and frequently discovered hidden things and future events. Section 4 The Legend of the Lady of the Wood is contained in the Yolo manuscripts and is a considerable antiquity. It's a most fascinating tale. Aenion, the son of Gwalchmai, was one fine summer morning walking in the woods of Trevelia when he beheld a graceful, slender lady of elegant growth and delicate feature, and her complexion surpassing every white and red in the morning dawn and the mountain snow, and every beautiful colour in the blossoms of wood, field and hill. And then he felt in his heart an inconceivable commotion of affection, and he approached her in a courteous manner, and she also approached him in the same manner. And he saluted her, and she returned his salutation. And by these mutual salutations he perceived that his society was not disagreeable to her. He then chanced to cast his eye upon her foot, and he saw that she had hoofs instead of feet, and he became exceedingly dissatisfied, as well he might. But the lady gave him to understand that he must pay no attention to this trifling freak of nature. Thou must, she said, follow me wheresoever I go, as long as I continue in my beauty. The son of Gwalchmai thereupon asked permission to go and say goodbye to his wife, at least. 
This the lady agreed to. But, said she, I shall be with thee, invisible to all but thyself. So he went, and the goblin went with him. And when he saw Anhalad his wife, he saw her a hag like one grown old. But he retained the recollection of days past, and still felt extreme affection for her. But he was not able to loose himself from the bond in which he was. It is necessary for me, said he, to part for a time, I know not how long, from thee, Anhalad, and from thee, my son Enyan. And they wept together, and broke a gold ring between them. He kept one half, and Anhalad the other. And they took their leave of each other, and he went with the Lady of the Wood, and knew not where, for a powerful illusion was upon him, and he saw not any place, or person, or object under its true and proper appearance, excepting the half of the ring alone. And after being a long time, he knew not how long, with the goblin, the Lady of the Wood, he looked one morning, as the sun was rising, upon the half of the ring, and he bethought him to place it in the most precious place he could, and he resolved to put it under his eyelid. And as he was endeavouring to do so, he could see a man in white apparel, and mounted on a snow-white horse, coming towards him, and that person asked him what he did there. He told him that he was cherishing an afflicting remembrance of his wife, Anghalad. "'Dost thou desire to see her?' said the man in white. "'I do,' said Enyan, "'above all things and all happiness of the world.' "'If so,' said the man in white, "'get upon this horse behind me.' And that Enyan did. And looking around, he could not see any appearance of the Lady of the Wood, the goblin, excepting the track of hoofs of marvellous and monstrous size, as if journeying towards the north. "'What delusion art thou under?' said the man in white. Then Enyan answered him, and told everything how it occurred twixt him and the goblin. "'Take this white staff in thy hand,' said the man in white, and Enyan took it. And the man in white told him to desire whatever he wished for, and the first thing he desired was to see the Lady of the Wood, for he was not yet completely delivered from the illusion. And then she appeared to him, in size a hideous and monstrous witch, a thousand times more repulsive of aspect than the most frightful things seen upon earth. And Enyan uttered a cry of terror, and the man in white cast his cloak over Enyan, and in less than a twinkling Enyan alighted as he wished, on the hill of Trevailier by his own house, where he knew scarcely anyone, nor did anyone know him. The goblin, meantime, had gone to Enyan's wife in the disguise of a richly apparelled knight, and made love to her, pretending that her husband was dead. And the illusion fell upon her, and seeing that she should become a noble lady, higher than any in Wales, she named a day for her marriage with him. And there was a great preparation of every elegant and sumptuous apparel, and of meats and drinks, and every honourable guest, and every excellence of song and string, and every preparation of banquet and festive arrangement. And now there was a beautiful harp in Anharad's room, which the goblin knight desired should be played upon, and the harper's present, the best in Wales, tried to put it in tune, and were not able. But Aenian presented himself at the house and offered to play on it. And Halad, being under an illusion, saw him as an old, decrepit, withered, grey-haired man, stooped with age and dressed in rags. Inyan tuned the harp, and played on it the air which Anharad loved. And she marvelled exceedingly, and asked him who he was. And he answered in song, Enyan the golden-hearted, where hast thou been, in Kent, in Gwent, in the wood, in Monmouth, in Meenol, Gorwenith, in the valley of Gwyn, the son of Nees? See, the bright gold is the token. And he gave her the ring. Look not on the whitened hue of my hair, where once my aspect was spirited and bold, now grey without disguise, where once it was yellow. Never was Anhalad out of my remembrance, but Enyan was by thee forgotten. But Anhalad could not bring him to her recollection, and then said he to the guests, 
If I have lost her whom I have loved, the fair one of polished mind, the daughter of Edna Vidvachan, I have not lost, so get you out, either my bed or my house or my fire. And upon that he placed the white staff in Anhalad's hand, and instantly the goblin, which she had hitherto seen as a handsome and honourable nobleman, appeared to her as a monster, inconceivably hideous, and she fainted from fear. And Enyan supported her until she revived. And when she opened her eyes, she saw there neither the goblin nor any of the guests, nor of the minstrels, nor anything whatever, except Enyan and her son, and the harp, and the house in its domestic arrangement, and the dinner on the table, casting its savoury odour around. And they sat down to eat, and exceeding great was their enjoyment, and they saw the illusion which the demoniacal goblin had cast over them. And thus it ends. From the Yolo Manuscripts Section 5 There is hardly a goblin in the world more widely known than this spectre of the forest. A story appears in legends of many lands, including China. Its ancient Grecian prototype is found in the Odyssey. In his fascinating essay on the folklore of France in the Folklore Record for 1878, published by the Folklore Society, Mr A. Lang says... So widespread is this superstition that a friend of mine declares he has met with it among the savages of New Caledonia and has known a native who actually died, as he himself said he would, after meeting one of the fairy women of the wild wood. When it is the Diawl himself who appears in the role of the familiar spirit, his majesty is usually in some other form than that of a man with hooves, horns and tail. The orthodox form of Satan has indeed been seen in many parts of Wales, but not when doing duty as a familiar spirit. A Welsh poet of the 13th century mentions this form. And the horned devil with sharp hooves on his heels. He is variously called Cuthriel, Dera, Diavol, all euphemisms for devil, equivalent to our destroyer, evil one, adversary as well as plain Diawl Devil. In his character of a familiar spirit, he assumes the shape of a fiery ball, a donkey, a black calf, a round bowl, a dog, a roaring flame, a bull, a goose, and numberless others, including the imp that goes into a book. In all this, he bears out the character given him in old mythology, where he grows big or little a pleasure and roars in the gale as Hermes, the wind god, howls as a dog, enters a walnut in the Norse tale, or is confined in the bottle of the genie of the Arabian Nights. To that eminent nonconformist preacher, Vavasor Powell, the devil once appeared in the shape like a house. Uh, Satan appeared several times, and in several ways to me, at once like a house, stood directly in my way, with which sight I fell on my face as dead, Another time, being alone in my chamber, I perceived a strong cold wind to blow. It made the hair of my flesh to stand up, and caused all my bones to shake. And on the sudden I heard one walk about me, tramping upon the chamber floor, as if it had been some heavy, big man, but it proved in the end to be no other than Satan. The last from the life and death of Mr Vavasor Powell, a curious seventeenth-century book, no two existing copies of which appear to be alike. I hear sight from that in the library of the Marquis of Boot, than which a more perfect copy is rarely met with. A black calf which haunted a Pembrokeshire brook early in the present century was believed to be the devil in familiar guise. It appeared at a certain spot near the village of Narberth, a village which has figured actively in mythic stories since the earliest ages, of which there is any record. One night, two peasants caught the terrible calf and took it home, locking it up safely in a stable with some other cattle. But it had vanished when morning came. Henry Llewellyn, of Ustradefoc Parish, Glamorganshire, was beset by the devil in the shape of a round bowl. He'd been sent by his minister, Methodist, to fetch from another parish a load of religious books, Bibles, Testaments, Watts, Psalms, Hymns and Songs for Children, and was coming along with the same on horseback by night when he saw a living thing, round like a bowl, 
moving to and fro across the lane. The bold Llewellyn, having concluded it was the devil, resolved to speak to it. "'What seekest thou, thou foul thing?' he demanded, adding, "'In the name of the Lord Jesus, go away!' And to prove that it was the adversary, at these words it vanished into the ground, leaving a sulphurous smell behind. To William Jones, a Sabbath-breaker of Risca Village, the devil appeared as an enormous mastiff dog, which transformed itself into a great fire and made a roaring noise like a burning gorse. And to two men at Merthyr Tidville in Glamorganshire, the fiend appeared in the shape of a gosling. These men were one night drinking together at the Black Lion Inn when one dared the other to go to conjure. Well, the challenge was accepted, and they went, but conducted their emprise with such drunken recklessness that the devil put out the eyes of one of them so that he was blind the rest of his days. Section 6 The mode of summoning and exercising familiar spirits, in other words, of laying and raising the devil, varies little the world over. Even in China, the magic circle is entered and incantations are muttered when the fiend is summoned. And for exorcism of devils, there are laws like our own. Though since modern Christianity has been introduced in China, the most popular exorcist is the Christian missionary. In Wales, the popular belief is compounded of about equal parts of foul magic and fair biblical text. Magic, chiefly for summoning, the book for exercising. John Jenkin, a schoolmaster in Pembrokeshire, was a conjurer of renown in that part of Wales. One of his scholars, who had a curiosity to see the devil, made bold to ask the master to assist him to that entertainment. Mm, I see him, said the master, if thou hast the courage for it. Still, he added, I do not choose to call him till I have employment for him. So the boy waited, and not long after a man came to the master saying he had lost some money and wished to be told who had stolen it. Now the master said to the scholar, I have some business for him. And at night they went into the wood together and drew a circle, which they entered, and the schoolmaster called one of the spirits of evil by its name. Presently they saw a light in the sky, which shot like lightning down to the circle and turned round about it. The conjurer asked it who had stolen the man's money. The spirit did not know, and it disappeared. And then the schoolmaster called another evil spirit by its name, and presently they saw the resemblance of a bull flying through the air towards them, so swiftly and fiercely as if it would go through them, and it also turned about the circle. But the conjurer asked it in vain who had the stolen money. I must call still another, said he. The schoolboy was now almost dead with fear, and the conjurer considerately waited till he was somewhat revived before calling the third spirit. But when he did call, there came out of the woods a spirit who dressed in white and went about the circle. Ah, oh, said the schoolmaster, we shall now hear something from this. And sure enough, this told the conjurer, in a language the boy could not understand, where the money was and all about it. And then it vanished in red fire, and that boy... Has never been well since, and the effect of the great fright still cleaving to him. Not far from Glanbran in Carmarthenshire lived a tailor, who added to his trade as a British mender the loftier, if wickeder, employments of a worker in magic. A certain Mr. Gwynne, living at Glanbran, took it upon himself to ridicule this terrible tailor. For the tailor was a little man, and Mr. Gwynne was a burly six-footer, who feared nobody. <laughs> thou have the courage to look upon the devil, sneered Gwynne. Canst thou show him to me? Well, that I can, said the tailor, his eyes flashing angrily. But you are not able to look at him. What? roared Gwynne. Thou able to look at him, and not I? Very well, quoth the tailor. If you are able to look at him, I will show him to you. It was in the daytime, but the tailor went immediately into a little grove of woods in a field hard by, and made a circle in the usual manner, 
He returned to fetch the incredulous Mr. Gwynne, saying, Come with me, and you shall see him. The two then crossed the field until they came to the stile by the wood, and when suddenly the tailor cried, oh, Look, yonder, there it is. And looking, Mr. Gwynne saw in the circle that the tailor had drawn, One of the fallen angels, uh, now become a devil. It was so horrible a sight that the terrified Mr. Gwynne was never after able to describe it. And from that time forth, he had a proper respect for the tailor. That was Book Two, Chapter Five of British Goblins by Wirt Sykes. A link to the full text can be found in the show notes at celtictomes.libsyn.com. That's L I B S Y N dot com. You can also find all of the names, place names and other non-English words written down for you in the show notes in the order in which they appear in this reading. If you'd like to comment on this chapter, pop over to our show notes and join in or start a conversation. If you've enjoyed this podcast, why not try our sister podcast, The Celtic Myth Pod Show, which brings the stories of ancient Celts to life with narrative and drama as well as bringing you modern Celtic music, stories and information. Find the Celtic Myth Pod Show in all the places where the best podcasts hang out or on our website at CelticMythPodShow.com. You've been listening to Celtic Tomes, read by Gary and Ruth. Our theme music is Gander in the Pretty Hole by Slauncher, and a link to their music can be found in the show notes at celtictomes.libsyn.com. This podcast has been produced by The Celtic Myth Show. Music